Hi, this is the sixth and last installment of a business ethics tutorial, and I'm going to wrap things up uh, with three final business case studies to practice uh, our skills at applying uh, ethical principles. I'm going to begin with looking at McDonald's and their influence on our diet. Then I'm going to look at a well-known case study called the Bullard Houses, and I'm going to finish up with an environmental case involving the Conical Oil Company. So first, McDonald's. Well, perhaps you saw the film called Super Size Me. It came out in 2004. It looked at the effect of McDonald's on our health and the obesity problem in the U.S. and so forth. Uh, the name came from the fact that at that time, you know, the McDonald's workers were instructed to ask the uh, customer, can I supersize you, meaning give you a large size of fries or a drink rather than the, the regular size. At about the time the film came out, McDonald's stopped supersizing. They claimed it had nothing to do with this film, but it was about the same time. Okay, so in the film, the, the director of the film, Morgan Spurlock, uh, went one month eating nothing but McDonald's. Morning, noon, and night, nothing but McDonald's. To see what it would do to him. Okay, well, what did it do to him? Well, he went to the doctor before, he went to the doctor after. He gained uh, 24 pounds during the month. He had a number of other problems. His blood tests were coming out bad, his liver and so forth. Uh, well, so it didn't look like it was a very healthy diet. And in fact, he had to go on a detox diet afterwards, you know, to lose the weight and get back to normal. It took a while. Uh, so the film suggests that this McDonald's diet is influencing the way we eat, and it's influencing our health and contributing to the obesity epidemic in the U.S. So we're going to try to look at the issue, is McDonald's doing something unethical here? We're going to look at this. There's a lot of good lessons in this case, and it does get some people upset. Okay, so I realize that. So bear with me. I'm not propounding a view here. I'm only showing you how the arguments play out, and you can think about it. Okay, so there's really two issues involved. One, is the McDonald's menu ethical? And two, how about their marketing practices, particularly toward children? So I'm going to look at that as well. Okay. I'm going to assume that there's full disclosure. Right? The customer knows what's in the Big Mac. You know, the ingredients, all the fat and the sugar and the calories, they're there, you know, easily available. So we have no problem with disclosure. Now, the usual arguments you hear, well, McDonald's is bad because they're, you know, they're harming their customers, right? They're feeding them food that's unhealthy. They're getting diabetes and so forth. Uh, and, you know, they're enticing kids to come in with these kids' meals, you know, happy meals. And the kids get hooked on this stuff. They develop a taste for it. All right. On the other hand, people defend McDonald's by saying, well, you know, these are consenting adults. This is what the customer wants. McDonald's is not responsible for what their customers want. They're just providing, you know, the demand. And besides, they offer salads. If you want a salad, although I understand that the dressing on the salad actually has more calories than a Big Mac. <laughs> Too bad. And finally, as for the kids, well, parents are responsible for their kids. That's their responsibility. Okay, so you, you can listen to these arguments all day long and get nowhere. Let's see if we can get somewhere with this. Okay. So f issue number one is the menu. Anything wrong with this? The utilitarian test is the key one here. Okay. What's the effect of offering this menu to the world? Um, it's a question of fact and not ethics. Okay. We cannot resolve the health effects of McDonald's marketing and menu by sitting around talking about it. You've got to go out there and research it. So that's why we distinguish issues of fact from issues of ethics. Then the ethical decision depends on the outcome of the research. Okay. On the other hand, we can't just sit back and say, well, I think it's okay. Right? Because there's probably a prima facie case here that the McDonald's menu is having a negative effect on health. Right? It's making people fat. At least it looks that way. So it's probably not rational to believe that McDonald's menu is having no negative effect given casual observation. At least we got to do is to research this issue. The least we got to do to be ethical here. Now, I'm going to make an assumption so we have something to talk about. Okay, I'm not claiming this. I'm only assuming for the sake of argument. Let's assume that the McDonald's menu could be adjusted to increase utility at least a little. If nothing else, they can take all that high fructose corn syrup out of the buns, out of the hamburger buns. Okay, they're going to taste the same, but you won't get as fat. I'm going to assume that there's something they could do, maybe a little, but at least something. And if that's true, they're failing the utilitarian test because they should do it. Now, I'm not assuming that McDonald's causes people to be overweight. 
I'm not assuming that McDonald's is doing more harm than good, or they're doing a lot of good. I'm only assuming that McDonald's could at least tweak its menu to make it better for people. If that's true, they're failing the test. Now, the response to that is the one I mentioned before. Okay, may be true, but these are consenting adults. We'll talk about kids later. These are people coming in asking for this stuff. I mean, who is McDonald's to say what people should eat? It's just not their responsibility, you know, to make decisions for other people. So, yeah, maybe utilitarian test, you know, has, has failed, but so what? Well, I have to tell you, utilitarian test takes into account all of the consequences, including those that are mediated by the choices of others. Now, if you don't think so, suppose you're a pharmaceutical company, and you have two possible projects in front of you. One project is a miracle cure for cancer. It's going to relieve millions of people from a horrible death. You can develop that drug, or you have another product that's, you know, it's really super duper toenail polish. Make your toenails look great. Okay. Equally profitable. Okay. You measure the utility. The cancer drug utility goes through the roof. It's wonderful. You know, the toenail polish, okay, not so good. So what are you going to do to pass utilitarian tests? Are you going to say, well, in either case, people freely choose to use the product, right? Okay, so, you know, people freely choose to take the cancer drug. The physicians freely choose to prescribe it. So there you have free choice, just like in the hamburgers and french fries. So for that reason, you're simply not going to count all that good it does. You're not going to count all that relief of suffering and death because other people choose it. Of course you're going to count it. So you've got to count all the consequences, even if free choices are involved. So that's the way the test works. As for this idea about being responsible for others' decisions, this is not to imply that McDonald's is supposed to be responsible. Let's suppose some customer comes in and gorges himself with chicken McNuggets and ruins his health. McDonald's is off the hook so long as its total utility is maximized. It's not responsible for that customer's decision. We're only saying that McDonald's is responsible for the total utilitarian consequences of its decision, which may be mediated or go through the choices of others. Now, am I being puritanical? That's a, sort of an Anglo-Saxon proclivity we have here in the U.S. Isn't life about some indulgence? Well, of course it is. You know, that's okay. You know, if you have a mom-and-pop restaurant, and they have these luscious fudge brownies, okay, and you give in to temptation to eat one. Well, that probably increases utility, right? You don't eat enough of those just once a week or once a month, and you, in, you love it. No problem. The difficulty with McDonald's is that they're ubiquitous. Right? They're everywhere. They're so convenient. And when they offer a product like that, everyone's eating it. The utilitarian outcome is different for them. This is the price of success. You have greater responsibility. You have greater consequences. You've got to consider those consequences. So, yeah, you don't have to be puritanical. Just consider the overall consequences. People can indulge to a certain degree, just not all the time. Okay? Now, the children thing. Well, the marketing is more aggressive than you might think. Okay? It's true they have the happy meals. They have the play areas to entice the kids and give them a free toy. Okay? But also, I mean, I have read that the marketing people actually ride around in SUVs with parents to watch the kids nag their parents at Topic McDonald's. And they observe which nagging techniques work. And then they demonstrate those techniques in their ads so the kids will know how to nag their parents. Now, maybe this isn't really true. I don't really know. But let's suppose it is true and think about whether it's ethical. Utilitarian test, we still have a problem. If this is deleterious to the kids' health, even though it's mediated by the free choices of the kids and their parents, it fails the utilitarian test. It's that simple. But we have also another test to think about, and that's the autonomy issue. Are we violating the autonomy of these kids by inducing them to want McDonald's food? They're kids that can't resist this type of temptation the way adults can. Are we exploiting these kids by circumventing their autonomy? Yeah, we are, but you know, we always do that with kids. We violate a kid's autonomy when we raise them in the home. You have to. Of course, one of the objects of raising your kids is that they will be autonomous adults later on. You prepare them for autonomy. But while they're kids, you have to say, you're, you're, you're going to do this. You know, you're going to think this way. This is part of raising kids. So parents already manipulate kids to some extent. We have to do that. So that's the McDonald's case. 
I'd like to move on to another case study. This is a very well-known case study. It's used often in MBA courses. It's called the Bullard Houses, and it's about negotiation. There is a family called the Bullard family that owns some decaying townhouses, and they'd like to have them redeveloped. They're going to sell them to a developer, but they don't want the development to be garish and commercialized. They just want a nice, pleasant townhouse development. There's a hotel chain, the Conrad Milton Hotel chain. He wants to buy these things and actually put a big high-rise hotel and use the houses as a kind of lobby for the hotel. Just the sort of thing the family doesn't want to happen. Well, the hotel chain is negotiating through an agent who is not telling who their client is. So when the Bullers go to negotiate with this agent, it's called Absentia, they don't know that the hotel chain is actually behind the bids. The agents, Absentia, have instructions not to reveal to the Bullers what their true purpose is in buying this property, because they know the Bullards you know, wouldn't go for it. They wouldn't sell. They knew. So the negotiators have these instructions. Okay. What do they do about this? Well, there's a couple of scenarios. In one scenario, the Bullards may specifically ask, do you guys have any commercial plans for this other than just developing the townhouses? What do you say? Okay, this. Or they may not ask. They may not bring it up. They're just sort of assuming that the development will be in line with what the builders want. Then do you say anything about it? Do you tip them off? Because we have these two related issues. Now, some of my students say, well, look, the Bullards, if they're concerned about this, could just put a clause in the contract to require that the property be developed in the right way. That's all they have to do. So there's no issue here. Let's go home. Problem is... They didn't do that. They're not asking for a clause in the contract. You've got to deal with that fact. So deal with it. Let's deal with that fact. Maybe they should put a clause in the contract, but they're not doing that. How do we deal with it? We've got to talk about negotiation. In good faith negotiation, what you've got to do to make the negotiation work, you've got to tell the other party what you're delivering, what you're selling. And you've got to allow the party access to the, the product so it, they can find out whether it's what they want. And finally, you, you have to avoid deceiving the other party. Negotiation just simply can't work if you don't have those three conditions satisfied. On the other hand, you're not obligated to reveal how much you want the product or what it's worth to you. So if I'm selling you a car, okay, I have to let you look the car over. I can't deceive you about what the car is all about. Okay, I have to tell you about the car. Okay, but I don't have to tell you that I can't even drive. So the car's worth nothing to me. I don't have to tell you that. In fact, I shouldn't tell you that because it would cause negotiation to break down. If you think about it, what happens in negotiation? Okay? So if I'm selling you a car, okay, I have the lowest price that I will accept for the car. If you're buying a car, you have a highest price that you'll pay. Okay? Suppose I tell you my lowest price out front. Then you'll only offer the lowest price. And suppose you tell me your highest price. I'll insist on your highest price, and we can never come together. Okay? The only way we can come together is if we don't know each other's highest and lowest price. Then we somehow try to meet in the middle. So when we make a bid or an offer, that's sort of giving some information about where our limits are, but not complete information. This is what negotiation always does all over the world. Okay? It's done in different ways, but that's the basic issue. You've got to conceal how much you want the product yourself, or you'll never come to agreement. So it's a necessity. So with that as background, that's suppose the Bullards are asking about, you're going to build a high-rise hotel here? What do you say? Well, one thing you might say is, no. Or you might say, we don't know. That's just a lie. It's an out-and-out -out lie. You do know. You do know there are plans. Okay? Lying is not generalizable. It's unethical. So you can't do that. Can you say, we're not at liberty to tell you the plans? Sure, you can say that. It's true, and it's not misleading. It's just, and then they can take it from there. Okay. Okay, is that enough just to say, we're not at liberty to talk about the plans? If you know what they want, are you obligated to say something more? So if they don't ask you any more about it, do you tip them off? So let's look at that. Well, first of all, we're not obligated to reveal to the Bullards how much we want this property. In fact, we're required not to reveal that. So at least prima facie, there's no obligation to tell them how we're going to use the property. 
that perhaps we shouldn't tell them because then they, they know, you know what it's worth to us. But perhaps there's some deception involved here. You know, by not fessing up to what's going on, perhaps we're deceiving them. Perhaps they assume that if we were going to develop the property contrary to their wishes, we would say something about it. If that's true, if they would expect us to say something about it, then we're deceiving them and that's not ethical. Perhaps they don't expect us. Perhaps they expect us to be a hard-nosed negotiator. In that case, there's no deception. So it's a hard one to call, and it depends on the precise situation. It depends on a question of fact, the psychological issues involved. What do they expect from us? Are they actually being deceived? So that's how you have to call that one. You sort of have to be on the scene to call it. There's another issue here, however. When you, when you carry out a complex negotiation, you have to form relationships with people. You can't get it through a complex deal. And that you sort of get to know the other guys. Look them in the eye. Go out to dinner with them for a few days. So you develop a bond of some kind to get through this negotiation. When that happens, then virtue ethics comes into the picture. Okay? If you can't look these guys in the eye, you know, when you know something that they don't know, you know, that betrays the relationship. Okay, so if the negotiation requires forming a relationship and you have to betray that relationship you know, to, to honor the wishes of your employer, you've got a virtue ethics problem. You've got to get out of there. All right, that's how I call it. Okay, so that's what I see the arguments coming to. Okay, we've got one more for you. Last one. This is Conoco. Now Conoco Phillips. Okay. So back in the 1980s, Conoco began drilling in the Ecuadorian rainforest. They were about a third of a consortium going out there to prospect for oil. The National Oil Company was going to receive 80% of profits after covering investment costs. Okay, so it's government land. They're focusing on something called Block 16, which is part of a national park, Yasuni National Park in Ecuador. And here's a photo of a very beautiful waterfalls in this tropical park, okay, largely undeveloped area. Well, there have been some environmental problems with past oil drilling. You know, millions of gallons of oils have been spilled, waste dumped into the rivers, the toxic drilling mud buried all over the place. Conoco wants to get out of this. They want to address some of these problems. There's also a problem involving the indigenous people who live there. Uh, they're building access roads, which encourages people to move in and occupy this land. They're clearing large areas of the forest. They're threatening the biodiversity. And as for the people, they're the Huarani people, I think I'm saying that right, uh, who have had very limited contact with the outside world, but now the presence of these oil prospectors is threatening to essentially destroy their traditional lifestyle. The Sierra Club is calling this ethnocide. Okay. Well, Conoco has a plan. At a cost of about a 5 or 10 percent increase in investment, they're going to mitigate these environmental damages. Their argument to the stockholders is that, well, we may get regulations slapped on us later, and it's cheaper to take care of it now. So they're going to collect the hazardous wastes, take care of the drilling mud, limit access by not building bridges into the area, and they presented this environmental plan to the local interest groups in 1990. Okay. Well, subsequently they sold out, they basically gave up. Uh, they sold out to a Maxis Corporation who was later bought out by an Argentine firm, a long tortured story. They got back in Ecuador in 2006. Uh, they bought Burlington Resources, got drilling rights, uh, but then Due to local opposition, indigenous rights protests, they uh, put the drilling on hold. And, well, that's where it stands today. Okay. So what's the issue here? What are a company's obligations to protect the environment beyond those required by law? So I'm going to suppose this, some of this pollution, at least in Ecuador, is legal. And what are their obligations to the people? Is this ethnocide? Now, people often answer by saying, you know, this is the government's problem. The government should step in and regulate these guys. Well, probably they should. But people will say, well, the government should do it. Therefore, the company has no responsibility. The problem is with the therefore. 
If the government's not doing, it's not so clear that the company has no responsibility. We have to look at that issue, so we're going to look at it. Utilitarian test is simple in principle. By prospecting for oil, the company is benefiting the world. They're obtaining cheap energy. On the other hand, they're creating damage. You have to do the ledger, add it up, and see what the consequences are. This is a question of fact, not ethics. We can't do this here. And we also have, well, if I don't do it, someone else will. We have that argument. If Conoco doesn't play the game the other guys are playing, someone else will come in and drive them out of business because they'll operate at lower costs, and the result will be the same. So you have to conclude that the pollution, to the extent necessary to stay in business, passes the utilitarian test. And apparently not too much pollution is necessary to stay in business because they're willing to take on a 5, 5 to 10 percent investment cost increase to reduce their pollution. Okay. But I'm going to suppose that a significant amount of pollution is necessary to stay in business there. All right. And then deal with the other issues. The basic problem here is that regulation in this part of the world is weak. I mean, this kind of behavior would be illegal in much of Europe or North America. What does this prove? Some people say, well, it proves they're sort of hypocritical. You know, they're willing to violate their own country's regulations when they go somewhere else, but yeah, I don't know what to conclude from that. However, you may be able to construct a generalizability argument. You might argue that these companies depend on a prosperous and well-developed economy up there in North America and Europe for their profitability. And these parts of the world are successful economically in part because they're not destroying their environment. They have environmental regulations. And if they didn't, perhaps it would destroy the first world economy. And this company wouldn't be able to exist as we know it. So perhaps it doesn't generalize. And if companies always violated these ethical rules about environmentalism, they would not be able to achieve their purposes. Okay, so you can construct that kind of argument here. Okay. Now, as for ethnocide, killing a culture is not the same as killing a person, right? The people may be, may be fine. You just destroyed their way of life. Now they're living a different way of life. Well, the traditional view, point of view in the West has been that these guys ought to be assimilated into the larger culture. The first school for assimilation was actually built in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. They took native people from North America and brought their kids in, dressed them up in Western clothes, cut their hair, taught them English, and insisted that they become just like Europeans. So that was the view at that time. Today we have a different view that indigenous culture should be respected for their own sake. In fact, there's a very strong indigenous rights movement all over the world, particularly in Ecuador. They're among the first. The traditional Western view is that agency only applies to individuals. We don't have a doctrine about the agency of groups. You can't murder a culture. That's because we are traditionally focused on individualistic ethics. However, in some cultures, in fact, most cultures, there's a collectivist mentality. Now, we see ourselves as autonomous individuals, but in much of the world, people that see themselves primarily as a member of the family or a member of the village rather than as an individual. The unit of existence is a collective, not an individual. So there, you know, autonomy applies to the collective and not to the individual. So maybe it is possible to have ethnocide, side, at least if you have a different concept of who you are as a human being. This, by the way, is an approach one can take to cross-cultural ethics, obviously a topic I can't get into right now. So from this broader point of view, perhaps we have a problem with ethnocide, something that Western ethics is going to have to look at in the future, I think. There is a virtue ethics issue here. Even if we can argue that the company can go ahead, carry out its operations in Ecuador, the people who are doing it may find this contrary to who they are. They say, I just don't want to be involved in this. Someone else would do it if I weren't here. But personally, this is not the contribution I want to make in my career. And they may have to move out for that reason. So here's a case where the individual manager may have a different set of obligations than the owners of the company. OK, that is my last case. I have a list of references here if you want to uh, pursue these ideas further. And you can have a look at my website, where there's a large number of materials there available. Uh, and I hope you will not stop with this short tutorial, but take this as a starting point to think uh, about how ethical issues can be analyzed. After all, they come up every day. You can get lots of practice. Okay, thank you very much.